Aaron Wolf at Ancestry, senior population geneticist. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Connie. Appreciate yeah. It. So this was kind of inspired because of the recent ethnicity estimates. And so I reached out to you folks over there at Ancestry to help the audience kind of understand what has changed from 2023 to 2024. So we are now calling, I guess, the ethnicity estimates are now origins. And there's some pretty dramatic differences between the two. And I also, before we jump into it, want to kind of talk about the journey. So we'll get into that a little bit. But just so you'll know, Aaron, I did a video recently called This Just In, Ancestry's DNA Estimates Have Been Updated, and there were hundreds of comments overwhelmingly saying how different some of their ethnicity estimates were. So this is not a hot seat. This is not like putting you on the spot here. I just want to help educate everyone, including myself, to kind of understand the differences. And so one of the things that I did, you know, you know how it goes with people will comment sometimes negatively before they comment positively. So what I did to help even the playing field, I guess, was I did a poll. And I asked in on the YouTube channel, I said, Ancestry DNA users, by now, you likely have received recent updates from the 2024 ethnicity estimates, now called origins. Based on your research, would you say the estimates are, do they seem reasonably accurate was one of the choices, dramatically different or drastically different, and more accurate in your opinion. I also asked a little different and not accurate in your opinion and drastically different and less accurate in your opinion. So basically you had two camps. You had more accurate and less accurate, whether they were drastically different or not. The poll results, in all fairness, these results are not scientific, right? But I had 1,100 votes. 58% of them said that they were reasonably accurate or drastically different, but more accurate. 25% said they were a little or drastically different, but not accurate. And 17% said they were not sure. So this is why we're here today is really to kind of help the audience understand. And again, I promise you this was not a scientific, you know, proper poll. It was just my way of trying to figure out because the comments were so dramatic in some of their language. I wanted to just ask a poll, click, click, you know, yes or no. Is it, is it more accurate or less accurate? And 25% of them are saying it's less accurate. So having said all that, <laughs> let's talk. First of all, how many DNA kits do you guys have now in the database? Thank you, Connie, for yeah, giving me this opportunity to talk about this update. So we have around 25 million samples in our DNA database. Uh, a large number of those are customers. Some of those are also you know, proprietary research samples that have been collected to increase the diversity and representation that we have to add you know, even more regions globally than we would usually just be able to from customers alone. We also need to understand our, the audience, regions versus journeys, I guess journeys. it is. Yep. So you're now refining the regions, right? You, you're kind of getting more granular with that. Is that part of the reason why we're seeing so many differences? That's certainly part of it. This update was one of the biggest we've had in a long time. We added 24 new regions, and that has, yeah, a large impact around people's results. Obviously, you can think of instances like in the past when we released uh, a Scotland region, and a lot of people who had Scottish ancestry before and were seeing a result of either English or Irish ancestry because those were the two regions that we had available, we're now seeing a big shift and we're seeing this new region along with changes in their in their existing regions already. And so again, as, uh, as that case, you know, here we're seeing that on a larger scale as well. We're adding 24 new regions, five new regions in Europe, several in Africa, several in West Asia and Southeast Asia as well. And you're really seeing kind of ripple effects around that. And kind of as those new regions are added 
And as the reference panel is updated to enable those new regions, we're seeing that kind of shift in people's results. And we really think that this is, you know, a step into increasing the precision, increasing the granularity of people's results overall. And it might not be that this single update, you know, fixes all issues for all users, but we think that we're moving from what was a very good position to an even better position uh, in the long term. Was there a difference in time frame for these ethnicity estimates or origins between the last couple of years and now? Because I want to think that the ethnicity estimates are going back, was it a thousand years-ish? Yeah, we often talk about the ethnicity estimate as giving a window into your origins between, say, 500 to up to a thousand years. We, We certainly know that there are traces of a much deeper origins that can appear in your region's results. With this update, we're really trying to adjust our reference panels for both new regions and for existing regions to try and control for some of that, some of those results and bring it into a more kind of familiar time frame for users. So for example, we know in the past from users and from our own data that Many people with roots back to England, especially the east and southeast of England, we're seeing somewhere around 5% of Scandinavian regions in the results, Sweden, Denmark, Germanic Europe as well. And that this really reflected long ago history when the Jutes, Angles, Saxons, Vikings, etc. were moving and peopling England. And so, you know, that's history from like 400 CE or 800 CE. So... Uh, a thousand years plus ago. And with the current update, we're really trying to address that and improve the reference panel so that those individuals are seeing less of those uh, deeper roots and more results that are reflective of their family history origins and something that is more familiar to them. So I've always said the ethnicity estimates are just estimates and that they will change over time. And clearly we saw that. Now, with your reference panel, the DNA is not the DNA alone. We've got to be referencing family history trees and records. Yes, no? Yes, the reference panel is built from individuals, a a large number of individuals in our customer base. And one of the special kind of, you know, powers we have or, or insights we have at Ancestry is the connection between the DNA tests and the family trees. And this has really in the past given us a lot of power to develop those reference panels and relying on information both from the DNA test and from the family tree to make sure that we're including people in, say, England for our England region who have very deep roots, who have a long family history to England. In this current update, we're again using both family tree data and also the DNA test data to update and and create new reference panels for new regions. So it's always been and continues to be that hybrid hybrid approach. Now, records aren't coming into a direct play here, right? You don't have AI pulling in record data to help create these ethnicity estimates, do you? That's correct. We're not using records directly. We're relying on a user-generated family trees in addition to the DNA results. So we're not scouring newspapers to try and you know, determine a likely family tree based on uh, obituaries or or birth registries or marriage records or things like that. That's correct. We're just relying on user-generated family trees and as well the DNA test results from those members and from other members as well. So I noticed on my own, and when you mentioned Denmark, my grandmother was 100% Danish, but I went from, I was somewhere in the 20s, 23%-ish down to about 9%, but I noticed my sisters held their Danish ancestry. So I would imagine that's a good recommendation as to why you want to get your siblings tested. Absolutely. Uh, Obviously, the more direct and related family members that you can get tested, the more complete picture you will have of your family origins. Again, we are connected to our ancestors through our trees, through our DNA. But you don't necessarily inherit all of the DNA, all of the regions from all of your ancestors. So in the cases you go back more and more generations, you know, you're talking about your grandmother or great grandmother, you know, your connection to the regions that they may have been from or may have had represented in their DNA 
may not come through into your DNA completely. So that's why, like you're saying, it's always a good idea to test a direct family member, siblings, cousins, aunts, uncles, et cetera. Yeah. Well, on, on that subject, I was going to ask this later, but I'm going to ask it now. Do you ever see a time when we will be able to use a group, say siblings, maybe my first cousins on that side of the family or whatever, where we could collectively start to rebuild the DNA of our ancestors? That's a really interesting question. I know people do that sort of at an ad hoc way with their own results. And I think we see some of those insights already with our side view technology, being able to separate out the regions you have, as well as the journeys and the matches and the traits into the parental side you inherited them from. So being able to differentiate which regions you got from your, your father's side, which ones you got from your mother's side. And I think doing that collectively across, again, a number of family members can allow you to kind of recreate that full picture of what your parents or even your grandparents, depending on who has been tested. Well, think about that. Wouldn't that be cool if you could then, you know, recreate this database and then turn around and upload it? I know Ancestry probably wouldn't want us doing that, but I just think that would be a great possibility if we could then, you know, and it might not even be in our lifetime, right? But to be able to collectively pull together my grandmother's DNA, (laughs) you know, and then create a DNA profile for her, wouldn't that take us even back farther? I'm geeking out here clearly. Yeah, we know that members are very interested in trying to learn as much as they can about their family history, about their family origins. And we're really looking into many possible ways to empower them on that on that journey. Let me ask you this. Let's talk about journeys for a minute. You used to call it communities. Tell us the differences between journeys and regions, because I want everybody to have a good understanding of that and the time frame for which journeys work. Absolutely. So Journeys are a more focused and more recent sort of look into your family origins. So we often talk about them as sort of giving you insights into the, the journey or the path that your family has taken in the past 50 to about 300 years. They use slightly different science to develop journeys versus regions. For journeys, we're relying much more on networks of matches to identify groups of people that are closely related to each other. And then we also very strongly rely on family tree data from those individuals to learn certain patterns about the people in that journey. So maybe they shared a common origin, they were all, you know, born in the same place, or maybe they shared a common destination, they all moved to the same place around the same time. So journeys really, again, illustrate that hybrid approach we're able to build for our customers that combines the DNA and the family history side. And the insights are can be much more specific with journeys in, in the sense that we can get down sometimes to the county level of, of a country or an area and provide you then also insight into how the people in that journey moved over time. So for example, in the past year, we released a number of African-American and Afro-Caribbean communities. And you can see for those individuals, both resolution down to county level in terms of where their ancestors lived around 1850 or so, and then also see the pattern of movement out of the South, for example, over time into the 20th century, part of the Great Migration to parts of the Midwest and also to the West Coast. And so really being able to see that illustrated, see some of the interesting history content we have that goes along with that, that's something that's very specific and very special to the, the ancestry journey features. Now, with these new updates, was through lines affected by this at all? Do you know? Or, I mean, that's kind of its own little algorithm, right? Yeah, through lines will not be affected by this. Through lines is based on your matches and then the trees that those matches have, have constructed. So this update won't be affecting your through lines results or insights in any way. Well, as long as we're talking about DNA matches, is there any new advice, technology, understanding about low centimorgan counts and re- with regard to, say, false positives? I know several years ago, you guys cut off the DNA matches. I think it was at eight centimorgans because the false positive threshold went up below eight centimorgans, correct? 
Well, it's absolutely true that as you get to smaller and smaller matches, the chances that that match is a, you know, a, a direct relative and in, in the way we think about it go down. We are always looking at new technologies to improve the precision of our matching and also to improve the reduction in those false positives. So at the same time, a while ago, we implemented an algorithm we call TIMBER, which is a silly acronym, but is is a very successful tool in reducing those false positives from your results. It doesn't, it's not perfect. Some of them still still exist. And so it does take, you know, a bit of detective work, especially as you get down into the smaller and smaller matches to try and verify with trees, with contacting the individuals to try and trace how you may or may not be related to those to those people. For those at home who might not understand what timber is, if I understand it correctly, it's basically lopping off the top and the bottom outliers, correct? It looks at patterns of shared matches that you have with other other individuals. And it, like you're saying, sort of lops off the very top end in terms of if you are sharing this short match with lots and lots and lots of people, it's more likely that that matches a pattern of, say, a shared ancestry or like being from the same population, same descent, rather than indicating that you're actually, you know, some fifth cousin to 4,500 people or something like that. Any updates on being able to divide our DNA matches by grandparents like you do now for parents? That's something that we hear members sharing a lot of interest in, and I can't predict or discuss too much about what's happening in the future, but it's certainly something that we're interested in trying to help members improve their ability to make those kinds of distinctions. Yeah. I think that would be awesome. I hope that helps. All right. You know, I've got to ask, is there ever going to be a day when you guys are going to have a chromosome browser? (laughs) I know you have a chromosome painter, but being able to compare our DNA cousins in a chromosome browser. Yeah, it's certainly, again, it's a feature that a lot of very, you know, very invested users are interested in. It's probably not something that, you know, the average consumer is going to make a lot of use of, but we hear from, obviously, you know, very serious genealogists like yourself that they, they absolutely want this. You know, we're looking into ways to provide that kind of resolution and to provide that kind of insight. So, yeah, but I can't, I I can't discuss what, what may or may not happen in the future. So, yeah. Well, what's next for Ancestry? What can you share? (laughs) Well, we're certainly, you know, we're very excited about the level of this update. We're excited to hear all the feedback from customers and take those insights and to try and integrate them into our roadmap for what we develop in the future and how we can, again, continue to add more granularity, continue to adjust our reference panel and always integrate that component of family history into the DNA DNA product. What didn't I ask that I should have asked? <laughs> oh, the the great the best journalistic question. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that that really covered everything incredibly well. I mean, I would just say again that we know a lot of people were very potentially surprised by some of the results. I think a lot of people became very familiar with the results for a while and I think what we've done in this update and what we'll continue to do is move from a very good position, you know, kind of a local on top of a, a large hill. And at this point, we're moving into like a higher mountain. So, yeah, so I think we're moving in a, in a, in a direction that will add even more granularity and continue to promise updates for, for customers. Fabulous. Aaron, thank you so much for taking the time today. We do appreciate your insights and hopefully we'll see you around here again soon. Thank you very much, Connie. Appreciate it.